This is section 6.2 volumes and our first objective is to find volumes of solids with known cross-sectional areas. And before we get into the nitty-gritty of how we do this, it's important that you be able to visualize the solids. Now I know when I took calculus forever ago, I could never visualize these. I didn't know what it meant. So I could certainly do the problems and kind of follow the protocol, but I had a hard time visualizing what these solids look like. So to kind of help you get a sense for this, let's Let's look at something that looks like this. Here's an example of a base that is a circle and what I would like to do is I would like to create cross sections that are all squares coming out of the board. So if a square is coming toward you and it has these chords as the base then that means for each one of these I'm now going to come out of the board and put a square so visualizing what that shape looks like is kind of tough a lot of people think it would be half of a sphere I have other people who think it looks like a cylinder and then I have still others that get sort of tent shapes or Pringles cans or a Pringle itself and so one of the things that I want to do before we get into finding the volumes of these is I want you to be able to know what this actually looks like in a three-dimensional world. So to help you do that, we're going to drop the y-axis flat. And then still, out of each of these, we want to build a square that's coming up off of the shape. So we can see four sample squares like this. Now for some people, as soon as I put those four squares on, they can actually see the shape. But for others, it's still a little rough. So what I'd like to do is I would like to create the solid by dragging a square through the shape. You can see as we get closer to the diameter, the squares get larger. And then as we move away from that diameter, the squares begin to shrink. And we're leaving a solid in its wake. So now within that solid, you can see the four squares and how they fit. We can also slide a square in that solid so that you can see that no matter which slice we make, we are still going to have a square. And we can start to rotate this and see how that square fits inside the 3D shape. So our goal in this particular case is to be able to find the volume of this solid. So before we go on, I want to just kind of test to see if you can visualize the other shapes. So here's another example. Let's look at a circle this time as a base, only this time I'm going to put equilateral triangles. So if I put equilateral triangles on each of those slices, hopefully you can start to see that the solid, unlike the one we just built, instead of having two spines, we're going to just have one spine. Notice those equilateral triangles get larger until the diameter and then they get smaller after we pass the diameter. And within that solid, we can put those four triangles and we can rotate at any time and see how those triangles fit. And the goal again is to find the volume of that shape. I've got one more to show you. Let's say that I have a circular base, only this time I'm going to do isosceles right triangles. So instead of equilateral, we're going to have isosceles right that look like this. Hopefully you can see that the solid will be similar to the one we had with equilateral triangles, except now that spine is going off to the side instead of down the center of the shape. So here's our solid with the four triangles inside and we can rotate to see how those fit. The goal is to figure out exactly how we're going to compute the volume. So just like when we found areas between curves where we sum up the areas of an infinite number of skinny rectangles, we can find volumes by su summing up the volumes of an infinite number of skinny 3D slices. The trick is going to be to write the volume of the skinny slice in terms of a single variable and to get our limits correct. So to set it up, we've got six steps. Our first step will be to graph all the boundaries of the base. We did this in 6.1 with areas, so that should be familiar. We're also going to label all the intersections, just like we did in section 6.1. Thirdly, we're going to draw a representative strip. 
Now in the section 6.1 we were able to select which way we drew our strip and here we're going to be told how to draw that strip. We're going to be told what we're perpendicular to. Then next we will use that strip to sketch a representative skinny 3D slice and this is the new piece. This is where it gets a little tricky and then we're going to use that strip to write the volume of the skinny slice and then we will add up all of the volumes using the correct limits. So let's look at some examples. With example 1 we want to find the volume of the solid with a base formed by the curves x equals 4 minus y squared so this is the sideways parabola opening left and the y axis when each cross section is a square perpendicular to the x axis. So step 1 was to graph all the boundaries of the base which I've done for you. Step 2 is to label all the intersections. So we've got this one here which is 0, 2. We've got this one here which is 4, 0 and this one here which is 0, negative 2. Then we're going to draw the representative strip. Well in this case we were told that the cross section is perpendicular to the x-axis so the only way we're going to be able to draw that strip is the way I've drawn this green one. Now we're going to label that with the correct letters. So again we're going to ask ourselves what coordinate is in common and it is an x. So the x will now mandate that the y coordinates be written using x's. Well up here we have x is 4 minus y squared and we need to isolate the y. So to do that we will have x minus 4 equals negative y squared. So that means 4 minus x will be positive y squared and y will be plus or minus the square root of 4 minus x. Well the positive root is the top half of the parabola so this will be a root 4 minus x positive and on the bottom we will have the negative root because we're on the bottom half of that parabola. Notice that both the points were coming from the same curve therefore we got both the top and the bottom coming from what y equals here. Now our next step which is different is to now use this strip to sketch a representative slice. So we have this strip and we're going to build a square off of it and it will have just a hair of thickness. So the thickness is going to come from the thickness of the strip which is a dx. The length of that strip is the top y coordinate minus the bottom y coordinate or two of those roots. Now because it is a square we know that the bottom is also going to be two of those roots. So if I can write an expression for the volume of this slice that would be 2 of these 4 minus x in the roots squared times the thickness. Once we have the volume of one slice we can add up or sum all of the slices as x ranges from its lowest value of 0 to its highest value of 4. This is now the volume in terms of x and it turns into a section 5.3 fundamental theorem of calculus problem. So that means I can now simplify my innards, pull the constant out in front, and then answer the question posed by the symbol. What did I take the derivative of with respect to x that gave me a 4 and an x? Evaluate that from 0 to 4, which is an 8 times 4, which gives me 32. If we look now at example 2, we want to find the volume of the solid with the base formed by these two curves when each cross section is an equilateral triangle perpendicular to the x-axis. So again, we have graphed the boundaries, we're going to label our intersections, then we're going to draw our representative strip. We were told that it had to be perpendicular to the x-axis and then we're going to label with the correct letters. Since these two share an x-coordinate, we know everything needs to be in terms of x. This x-coordinate comes off of the parabola that opens down which is the 2 minus x squared and this point here comes off the parabola that opens up which is the x squared. So now if I use that strip to draw a representative slice it is an equilateral triangle with just a hint of thickness and that thickness is the thickness of this strip which is dx the base is going to be a 2 minus x squared minus an x squared which is 2 minus 
two of those x squared. And then if I want the volume of this shape, I'm going to have one half the base, which was that two minus two x squared, times the height. And the height is a little tricky, so we've got to remember what we did in our geometry classes. In order to get this height, we need to remember that this is a 30, 60, 90 triangle, and that this piece is half of this, which is one minus x squared, and that's the short leg. The long leg is therefore going to be this times a root three. So I will get a one minus an x squared, times a root three. So now I've got one half the base times the height, and now lastly I need the thickness. Now this represents the volume of one slice. To get all of the volume, we need to sum them up, and we need to let x go from its smallest value to its highest value. So that would be from negative one to one. Now another variation on this is that we can use the symmetry of this shape and just double the accumulation from zero to one. Notice that the two will cancel this and I'll end up with a one minus x squared squared times a root three dx. So in order to finish this, I would multiply out, and then I would use my fundamental theorem of calculus part two and answer the question, what did I take the derivative of with respect to x that gave me this inside? Well, that is an x minus a two x cubed over three plus an x to the fifth over five, and I will evaluate from zero to one, which means I plug in the one first, and then I subtract what I get when I plug in the zero. Finish this up to yield, 16 root 3 over 15. With example 3 now, we want to find the volume of a solid with a base formed by a circle, x squared plus y squared equals 9, and each cross section is an isosceles right triangle that has a leg perpendicular to the y axis. So again, I've already graphed the boundaries for you. We can put our limits, or rather our intersections, on the x and y axis, and then we can draw our strip and label it with the appropriate variable. Notice that we cut perpendicular to the y, so everything needs to be in terms of y's. Notice too that the equation for this curve that the points are on is the circle, so we need to get x in terms of y in order to finish these points. So if I isolate x, it will be plus or minus the square root of nine minus y squared. The positive root is the right side of the circle, and the negative root is the left side of the circle. Now that we have labeled the strip, we can take that strip and create the shape that is given to us. It's an isosceles right triangle, so that means that these two will be the same, and it's a right triangle with a hint of thickness. That thickness will be the thickness of this strip, which is a dy. The leg will have a right minus a left x-coordinate, which is two of those roots, and because it is isosceles, we know this will also be the same thing. If I want to write the volume now of this one slice, it will be one-half the base times the height times the thickness, which is dy. If I want to get the entire region's volume, I will need to sum up all of these from this lowest y value up to the highest y value. Well, the lowest I could go is negative three, and the largest I can go is positive three. I could also use the symmetry and realize that it's double the accumulation from zero to three. To evaluate this now, I'm going to want to simplify and pull all of the constants out in front. So I'd have a two times a half, which is one, times a two times a two, that gives me four of those integrals from zero to three, and then the root times the root will just give me the inside. If I now answer the question posed by this symbol, what did I take the derivative of with respect to y that gave me the inside? Well, that's nine y minus y cubed over three, evaluated from zero to three. Plug in the three, plug in the zero, and we end up with 72.
With example 4 now, we want to find the volume of the solid where each cross-section is a circle with a diameter perpendicular to the y-axis, and we're bounded by the curves x equals 0, y equals 4, and y equals 2x. So again, we have graphed the boundaries. Now we're going to label the intersections, and we'll draw our strip as it is mandated by the problem. We're perpendicular to the y-axis. That tells us that we're going to label everything in terms of y. So the y-coordinate is shared in both points. The x-coordinate needs to be written in terms of y. On this particular curve, the x-coordinate is always 0. On this particular curve, we are on the equation of the line y equals 2x or x equals y over 2. Now we know the length of that strip, and that length becomes the diameter of our circular shape. So now remember that this circle has just a hair of thickness, and we want to write the volume of it. Well, the volume is going to be a pi times a radius squared times that thickness, which is dy. Well, the radius is going to be half of that diameter, and it is a horizontal distance, which means we'll take the right x-coordinate minus the left x-coordinate. That's a y over 2 minus 0. That's the diameter, so now we need to do half of that to get the radius. Then we will add up all of them from the lowest y-value, which is 0, to the highest y value, which is 4. Now for ease of computation, we want to compute all of our constants first and pull those out in front. So it looks like we'll have a y over 2 over 2. That's going to be a y over 4. So when we square it, that will become a 16 on the bottom. So I can pull a pi over 16 out in front, and I'll be left with a y squared inside. So now I'm poised to use the fundamental theorem of calculus and answer the question, what did I take the derivative of with respect to y that gave me y squared? And that is a y cubed over 3 evaluated from 0 to 4. So I'll have a pi over 16 times a 4 cubed, which is a 64 over 3, minus a 0. Finish this up, I get a 4 pi over 3. Now that we've done the four examples, I'd like you to think about where you're going to encounter the most opportunity for error. Which shape, which um, sorts of graphs, etc., etc. Think about where you might make errors so that you can plan ahead and watch for those times.